Awesome. Cool. All right. So um, we are going to go into the first keynote of the day. And um, we have Justin. <laughs> we have Justin Florey. <laughs> and um, he's going to be talking to us about the open source launch pad, the then and now look at tech careers. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? Not too tired? Got enough coffee before you came here? <laughs> All right, we'll wait just a second here. OK, perfect. So my name is Justin, and today I want to talk to you about the open source launch pad with a then and now look at tech careers and how open source fits into this puzzle. Actually, it was perfect following Desmond here because his topic is super re relevant and related to this one as well. All those things he was talking about tie in to the things I'm going to be sharing with you today, too. So, okay. there we go. So, if you ever will hear me on a stage talking about open source, you will hear me say this a lot. What is open source? Open source is a method that we use to develop and distribute software, as well as a set of best practices to make software and build teams that make software. It's also a movement that's based on ideals and a philosophy that go beyond just code or software. It's also rooted in a belief that software has an impact that's greater than any one of us individually, and that there are certain freedoms that should be protected. And finally, it's a culture. It's a collection of people, values, and ideas that just so happen to take the form of software projects and communities. So what am I here to talk to you about today? I'm here to tell you a story about the 40-year history of this open source movement. And what exactly is all this free stuff that, what, when we talk about open source, what is this free stuff? And how can you build a career and find ways to sustain yourself working on free stuff? So a little bit about who I am. Uh, so my name is Justin, so I'm originally from the United States. A uh, bit about me and my recent career highlights. So last October, I joined Red Hat as their, in their open source program office, or OSPO, as a community architect. So in my job there, I work on a project called Fedora Linux, which is the upstream for one of Red Hat's biggest enterprise and commercial products. Before that, from June, or from June 2020 to October 2022, I worked with UNICEF in their Office of Global Innovation as an open source technical advisor. And there I worked with UNICEF's Venture Fund as an open source coach. So I was guiding all these different startup countries or startup companies from multiple different countries on how you build an open source product and build a community around what you're trying to build. Uh, before that, I've participated in various other open source projects and communities over the years. So my academic days aren't so far behind me. I studied networking system administration in my university. I got to even study and minor in open source while I was in school. And I graduated from my university in May 2020, so peak, peak pandemic. So with me and Fedora, long before I had my first job, and even before I started at my university as an undergrad, I was, there was Fedora for me. Uh, so Fedora Project is a community of people working together to build a free and open source software platform and to collaborate on and share user-focused solutions built on that platform. Or in just simple English, we make an operating system and we make it easy for you to do useful stuff with it. So I started participating as a contributor in Fedora back in 2015, right around when I finished, uh, got my high school diploma. So I attended the contributor conference for Fedora called Flock that same year. And coincidentally, it was scheduled the week before I was going to start my undergrad classes. So I moved up early and got to meet all these people and check out what all this Fedora thing was. So since then, Fedora has always been a part of me and what I do. I've contributed to various parts of the community, mostly in a non-engineering capacity. Uh, the pictures that I have up here on the screen are from various 
conferences, events, and hackathons that I helped organize and, and present at for Fedora while I was a, a university student. So after seven years of being a volunteer contributor, I was lucky enough to land a full-time role at Red Hat working on Fedora all the time, all day. Uh, so the part that makes my job so wonderful for me is the amazing people that I get to work with in the Fedora community. Sometimes that's my colleagues at Red Hat, sometimes that's people at other companies who are working in Fedora, and a lot of times it's people who are just volunteers who do it because it's fun or interesting or they're trying to learn something new. So for me in chaos, I started getting involved in chaos back in 2018 as part of research that we were doing at the time in the Fedora Linux community. Uh, fast forward to 2020, I was working at UNICEF to evaluate their open, the open source projects and companies we were working with. So naturally I turned to a lot of the work that Chaos is doing around metrics and measuring to help go into that space a little bit more. So in the picture here, this was from Chaos Con Europe. Oh, I don't know if I... There we go. So this picture, this is from Chaos Con Europe 2020, where I presented there about the scoring system that me and my colleague at the time, Cecilia Shapiro, had developed for, for UNICEF. Today, I participate in a lot of the metrics working groups in Chaos, mostly the DEI working group and the DEI review team. Uh, DEI is really important to me, and Chaos is this community where you can really actually apply these things into practice and get real experience working on that, too. So, what is free stuff? I'm going to tell you a short story about, about all the things that we call open source. And why do people care so much about it? Why, why do we care about it? Uh, so by a show of hands, how many of you have seen this quote before? You know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. See a few hands. Uh, it's famously mis misattributed, I found out while I was researching this. Most people say, uh, I guess it's attributed to Gandhi, but I don't know who actually said it. But uh, if you look at it, uh, you can actually translate the history of the free software movement to each of those four lines. So I'm going to take you through each of these four chapters of the open source story to see how we got to where we are today. So first, they ignore you. The first major milestone in this one was in 1983 with the GNU project. GNU was uh, developed partly in the MIT media labs in the early 80s by a, uh, a guy who worked there called Richard Stallman. And he was a researcher, faculty member at MIT, and he had lived through this period of open access to software because before this time, nobody really cared about software. Uh, because at that time, everyone was on hardware, that was where all the money was, software was, you had to compile it for different, all these different hardware, so people didn't really value it the way that we do now. But it was in the 1980s that suddenly we see this shift, that software becomes a commodity. You can pay money for software. That's when that change first happened in the industry. So Stallman saw this thing where suddenly there was this shift in the commercial market for software. And he was used to this place in research and academia where people were just sharing software all the time, sharing their improvements and fixes with each other when there were issues, and suddenly that was stopping. So what, he's, what does he do in 1983? He decides to build his own operating system and define his values for how he's gonna do it. Two years later, you have the Free Software Foundation in 1985 that's founded. Notably, this was the, it was founded in part by Stallman, but also others, and it was originally to help sustain that GNU operating system. Over time, it became the, really the first notable institution to protect and embrace free and open source software. Uh, and then if you go forward four more years to 1989, we see this uh, GNU public license, or GPL, that's uh, first drafted that year. And it was drafted by the Free Software Foundation. And while it was not technically the first license, it was the first license of its kind that introduced this thing called copyleft. You can come and find me later if you want to talk more about that. What was relevant here is that it marked a significant shift in the perspective in the way that software is developed and how we distribute and share it with each other. So then they laugh at you. Uh, I don't know, how many of you recognize this guy on the screen? Is this familiar? So this, this is Linus Torvalds. He was the creator, is the creator and maintainer of the Linux, Linux operating system kernel. Uh, so in 1991, this is when he launched uh, the Linux kernel as a 
kind of a, kind of an operating system thing. I won't get too much into, into that. But the relevant thing here is that this is one of the earliest open source projects. It was also an early adopter of the GPL license I just mentioned on the last one, using the version 2 license that was drafted that same year in 1991. And the Linux kernel development practices would go on to shape the entire decade of how open source software was being made across the 1990s. Fast forward a little bit more into 1997. Not sure where I have the point exactly. There we go. So uh, this book called, uh, this was 1997, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. What's notable about this book is just that this is when open source is finally coming into the mainstream. So the author of this book, his whole idea was that the cathedral was this very formalized, proprietary software development model. And then on the other hand, you have this bazaar, which was this open market of open source ideas and everyone just doing little pieces. And this is what he was trying to communicate in that book. But there was one problem in 1997, is that when you said uh, this word free, businesses and this executives and the company and software end would get very scared and very nervous when you were talking about free, free stuff with their software. So in 1998, we see the Open Source Initiative. I have to like peek over here. There we go. Uh, 1998. So also called the OSI, and their their role in the beginning was really to act as a liaison between all these free free culture, open source people, and the business world. So convincing the business world that free does not necessarily mean no bottom line or no revenue was a big part of their initial approach. Uh, and this is also where we see the first usage of open source actually start to appear. Before that, it was all free software. So 1998, now we actually are using this word open source more commonly. Then they fight you. So in the early 2000s, uh, the tides had not yet turned. Open source was still this weird, gross thing that businesses and companies wanted nothing to do with. I always uh, love this quote from Microsoft, uh, from Jim Alchin at the time in 2001, open source is an intellectual property destroyer. I can't imagine anything worse than this for the industry. Uh, so Microsoft made, no, no, made their feelings no secret. Uh, top exec, uh, and then another one that I remember at the time is also calling Linux a cancer around that time. There was a lot of other things as well that were very, you know, the business world hadn't quite warmed up to this idea of open source yet. But then when we fast forward into the next decade, into the 2010s, suddenly everything is looking very different. Uh, the, do the tides ever turn? So the first thing is Microsoft in 2015, Satya Nadella. Microsoft is officially in love with Linux and open source. They have over 140 working groups dealing with four, over 400 projects that are all in the open source licenses and are being shared back to the community. A little bit more in 2018, if I remember right, uh, Microsoft acquired GitHub for $7.5 billion. And then furthermore, uh, IBM goes on to acquire Red Hat, my current employer, for $34 billion. So this remain, and this remains one of the largest ever technology acquisitions to date. You can count the ones bigger on one hand. So needless to say, from a capitalist market perspective, open source has won. But now that open source is finally not controversial, and it's often expected in many cases, what does it actually mean to be open source? So I have this handy little mnemonic. I remember these as the four R's. If there's anything that you can remember about open source and what that means, it's these four freedoms is what they're often called. So, uh, these are the essential principles. If you take away any one of these things, whatever you're doing or creating, it's no longer open source. It might be something else, but it's not open source. So the first one is the freedom to read, that you can find the source code or you can study something, understand how it works. You have the freedom to run it or use it any way that you like. Someone can't say you can only use it on this computer at this time or there's no restrictions on how you can use the software or the content or the data. Uh, and then to revise, you have the freedom to make changes and modify it however you wish. There's no restrictions on what kinds of changes you make. And finally, redistribute. You can share your changes with other people. 
So those are the four things that when we're always talking about open source, those are the things that people mean. That's what's being included in the deal when we get into licenses and software. Again, if you take away any one of those things, whatever it is, it might be something, but it's not open source. So finally, what is the future of working on free stuff? I just want to cover some metrics here really quick just to kind of show what the landscape looks like in 2023. So this is all coming from GitHub on their 2022 Octaverse state of the state of the Octaverse report. Uh, so just on 2022, uh, over 94 million developers are on the platform and 20.5 million joined in 2022 alone, which is huge. That's larger than the number of people for, for context who live in the Netherlands and it's just shy of how many people live in Sri Lanka. So just imagine how silly it would be for a moment if every single person in the Netherlands decided that they were going to start contributing to open source on GitHub. It's a lot of people that are out there. Uh, also, uh, on 20, 2022, there are over 85.7 million repositories that are out there, um, and there's no shortage of projects to choose from. The challenge is having to stand out and attract new contributors to a project in what is becoming a very competitive space. Further to that point, also last year, GitHub recorded over 3.5 billion contributions on the platform. And that could be things from commits, to issues, to pull requests, to discussions, to gists, to pushes, pull request reviews, everything in between. So I'm just gonna share, uh, I think actually, uh, Desmond's talk before me did a really good job of getting more concrete about the details of how you can get involved. I'm going to take it from a higher level here and just look at different spaces where open source, is, open source exists and how it's becoming a part of our software world that we live in today. So we'll talk about commercial uses in the business and the enterprise. We'll look at government really quick and then we'll look at international NGOs and agent, uh, aid agencies. On the commercial side, I think this one is probably the easiest one to look at just because there's really, it's really hard not to find these days. Um, I think generally where we are today, you'll hear a lot of people talking about OSPO, Open Source Program Office. Uh, this is becoming a thing a lot of the enterprises and big companies are doing to organize their open source work because there was so much of it happening a lot of times that it was just, it was becoming a problem. People were getting into trouble with it because people weren't paying attention to it amongst other reasons, but in many ways, the OSPO helps unify the open source activity in the organization. So if you're gonna hang out for OSCA Fest this week, and you might hear some people that talk about OSPOs and what that means. Um, some examples here is also Google. They have their Google Summer of Code that comes from their open source program office, and they've been doing that for I don't know, it's over, at least over 10 years, I know longer. Um, as one example, my employer, Red Hat, all of the products that we make in, our, in the company are based on or are completely open source. So in that way, like almost anything that you are hired to work on at Red Hat, you're almost always going to, you, you, are, you are going to have to be involved in open source in some kind of capacity. Um, there's also outreachy internships, I think are another great example. Um, Meta and Facebook, they actually have a really huge open source program office uh, with React and they have a bunch of DocuSaurus, a bunch of other projects that they steward. Um, no shortage of examples in the commercial space. On the government side, I'll just look at one example here with the 18F in the United States. So there's a part of the United States government called the General Services Administration and 18F is kind of like the tech uh, digital services delivery or tech expert team in the US government and so as part of their I'll read what their statement is here is that they develop in-house digital solutions to help agencies meet the needs of the people and the businesses that they serve this requires flexibility in how they code with a focus on lowering costs for the American people while improving interaction their, the people's interactions with the US government so the default position of the 18f whenever they create a new project is to one use free and open source software licenses so that it's not charging users a, a purchase or a licensing fee and that there's options to contribute back. Uh, they also, too, they develop their work in the open so you can actually see the work happening out there on GitHub for all these different government services. And third is that they publish publicly all source code created or modified by 18F, whether that's developed in-house by the government staff or through contracts that are negotiated by 18F. 
And finally, on the international NGOs and agencies, this is my background before I went to Red Hat. I was working with UNICEF, uh, doing all things open source there. One example I really loved was I got to work with a project called Seaboard, which is a AAC project, augmented uh, an alternative communication tool. So for they built a, a, a platform using kind of like pictures and text that you could, if you had a speech disability or you had a hard time communicating, you could create sentences and talk to other people by choosing these pictures. And this product was one that was developed by folks in Argentina that was ended up being distributed across Eastern, Southern Europe. Uh, and I love this one. Uh, oops, let me change the slide here. Um, just because it was a really like highly impactful example of how open source projects are, especially like in public sector, UN agencies, it's really becoming a huge thing there as well. So let's wrap this up. How can this all, everything I've just told you now, how can this actually connect into your career? So I'm gonna give you three takeaways here. Uh, if there's anything you remember from my talk, it's these three things. So the first one, uh, is to remember those four freedoms. The freedom to read, run, revise, redistribute, or the four R's. Uh, so, you know, open source is almost becoming a buzzword these days. So I think it really is important that you remember what people mean when they say open source, uh, and whether the way someone else is using open source actually includes these four freedoms. Because it might not if you ask someone. So it's always good to be clear about these things. Because if they're not, whatever they're doing, it's just not open source. Second, uh, use open source as a way to launch or grow your career, which I think was pretty much Desmond's talk right before me. Uh, participating in open source projects and communities can help you apply either it's new skills that you're learning, you're trying to break into something new or learn a new skill. Uh, it can help you network with other industry professionals to grow your network and meet other people. And it can also build connections that can lead to a big break, whether that's your first tech job or just trying to spin your career in some new direction. And third, and finally, get to know your fellow attendees here, other speakers, and the organizers. The events like these are excellent opportunities to network and get to know other people and learn something new. There's a lot of knowledge that's just here floating around in this room, if you can just grab it and collect it. So think about how you go from being a, a passive attendee to a more active attendee so that you can leave the event with more than you had when you came in. Uh, I really cannot overemphasize the importance of that networking and getting to know other people. Like for example, if I hadn't gotten to know Ruth uh, back when she was starting to do chaos things, then I probably wouldn't have been here on the stage talking to you right now. Uh, so if you wanna get in touch with me, you can find any of my contacts there. I've got Twitter. Uh, GitLab, Matrix, and my website that are up there on the screen. Uh, you can also find me around this week. I'll be here at ChaosCon and the uh, uh, Oscar Fest during the week as well. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Can we please jump those hands again? So if you do not remember anything, Justin mentioned um, you have the freedom to what? The freedom to what? Okay, that's a little disorganized. Let's, let's do it again. You have the freedom to do what? Awesome. Um, okay. All right, so um, before we go into the next thing, I want us to. All right, so um, we're taking questions for the keynote. Does anyone have any question? Cool. So my question is that, Actually, you wanted to address it, but I think it skipped his mind. So why would someone build a career around free stuff? Who will buy me data? How will I get <laughs> all those things? So, okay, okay, okay. Uh, Justin, this question is for you. You should ask him, like, how would you build a career around something that is free and not paid for? I think a, a big part of it is that 
exposure part. Like for me, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely an example of that because I started working in, uh, in open source long before I had a job or career in tech. And I think what open source allowed me to do was in my, in my very beginning, before I had really any job experience, I, I was still in university, was I got to kind of see what goes into this open source project. So for me, it was Fedora Linux. And I got to see, like, OK, there's all these different teams, and people are doing design over here. Some people are packaging software over there. And I was like, OK, well, like, I was like, so marketing and content, like writing for a blog or like a, a publication, those were interesting things to me. I had no experience in how to do those things, and I was just like, Sounds cool. Can I can I help with it? And someone was like, Sure. Like, here's our document. Here's some documentation to help you get started. Like the things Desmond mentioned are good signs to look for in a community or people and things that interest you and a, a good technology stack. Things that you're interested in. Um, when you take that and you can use that as a way to learn those new skills. Like for me, I got to learn a lot about like search engine optimization and all these different things about WordPress just because I was helping write for the Fedora magazine which was just this user, like Linux user publication that Fedora runs. So I think it, it really is, it's a very personal, I think, decision around what kind of things you're interested in, where you want to take your career. But I think that's the power of open source is you can show up into a community or a project with zero experience. And if there's a helpful community there that can bring you in, you have that opportunity to do these things without having to have a degree or some qualifications. And you can get real experience that you can take into the into the workforce or into a your first job. All right, so um, we have one more question. So I picked the parts where you talked about the Google Summer of Codes. So when you want to like apply to the Google Summer of Codes, is it that you have to like contribute to the company's open source projects or just any random open source and use it to apply? So that's a great question. I'll give you the, the documented reason and the undocumented reason. So the official on paper reason is that, like, yes, like you are like with Outreachy, with Google Summer of Code, they have that community process or community phase. They have different names for what they call it. But there is that idea that, like for a month or so, you're just hanging out in the project community. You're maybe working on a small project or something that is kind of getting you uh, more exposed in the community and also helps the people who are running the internship to see you and say like, oh, like, here's this person that got, like, they get a two pull request during this month and uh, you can get that exposure during the application process. Uh, however, the like, undocumented or unofficial thing is I think if there's a community that you know gets involved with Google Summer of Code or Outreachy and that's something that you'd like to pursue, you know, there's no reason you only have to show up in May. Like, so for me, I was in Fedora in 2015. It was probably like eight months or so I was in the project before I ended up, I did Google Summer of Code in 2016. And so it did, I did participate in that community bonding phase that Google Summer of Code has. But then I was also doing all this stuff before then too. So the people who are running the project, they knew me a little bit. They, I, I wasn't a stranger, basically. So I think that helped me because you know I was I was there I'd been around so I was recognized, um, but I think that's kind of the thing is that it, you definitely don't want to overlook that stage of that community participation phase during Google Summer of Code or Outreachy, but if there's a community that you're really interested in and you want to get involved, try to see if there's other ways you can participate ahead of time before the official application start and end date. It'll just give you that extra edge. Thank you so much, Justin, for answering those questions. Um, yeah, and thank you both for asking. Um, so we're going to just going to move into the next agenda, which is the tea break. <laughs> but before that, I want to do a social media shout out. Please bring out your phones. All right, your phones, your phones, your phone. You don't have one. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, for, all right, so um, take a picture with the person sitting next to you and tweet at us. It's Chaos Africa on Twitter. Chaos underscore, there's an underscore Africa, right? Then there's, there's, there's a hashtag, it's hashtag ChaosConAfrica2023. Did you get that? Pictures, pictures. Oh, oh, I don't know. Did you take 
screens or pictures of when any of the speaker is speaking. Just post that as well. You can take pictures of me. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. I, I'm looking so good today, so yeah. You can take pictures of me. Just let me know, so I'll pose. Are you taking pictures of me? 